Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum. I'm Tavia Gilbert, and I'm glad to welcome you back to another cutting-edge conversation with business leaders and creative luminaries tailored to global security professionals. Today is the second in a special four-part series in which Steve and I discuss the ISF's latest report, Threat Horizon 2023, Security at a Tipping Point. Today, we are back to focus on the report's first threat, Machines Seize Control. Steve, what is the report referring to exactly when it talks about the potential for a machine takeover? I mean, that's like Terminator material. So what's actually going on? Well, what we're referring to here, Tavia, is the fact that the speed and the accuracy at which technology is able to operate will prove to be something of a double-edged sword as automation pushes humans aside. So this sort of allure of technology-based solutions for managing risk will, I think, you know, lead to overconfidence in security and a reduction in human involvement that is going to lead to failings that security practitioners are unable to understand or resolve. So the deployment of automated defenses that act without human assistance to secure information will enable organizations to quickly react and respond to threats, obviously. But that automation, and we talked about this so many times, you know, that automation is also going to empower attackers to strike with the same machine speed, stretching defenses to the limits. Yeah, you know, we have talked many times about AI as a double-edged sword, And we've discussed before the sorts of AI attacks that are becoming increasingly common these days. So I understand that there are high volume, low impact spray and prey style attacks like phishing that spread the attack surface as widely as possible and that rely on human error. And then there are spear phishing and whaling attacks, more tailored, low volume, high impact. And those require specialist knowledge and extensive research. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly spear phishing whaling, you know, does require a lot more effort on, on the part of the attacker before they launch the attack. When we talk about AI, of course, you know, artificial intelligence industrializes those high impact attacks. And I think the emergence of AI based tools will give rise to a wave of customized high volume high impact attacks that really leave organizations struggling to deal with increasing numbers of incidents and unfortunately operational downtime. The impact of adversarial AI tools and techniques is going to be widely felt. Not only, I think, is AI going to become available to a range of malicious actors via crime as a service platforms, we're starting to see that already, but it will also continuously evolve and learn. And that's one of the key challenges in combating it, because it's going to learn how to circumvent established defenses. So by using AI to automate cyber attacks, you know, the need for skilled hackers to write bespoke code will diminish in favor of services that are able to deliver AI enabled attacks. And the ability of these services to modify themselves in real time as the attack progresses and adapt the techniques to defeat the target organization's defenses is really going to maximize the chances of success. I think as well that, you know, the high tempo of attacks that inevitably we're going to see is going to place organizations under mounting pressure as they struggle to deal with an avalanche of concurrent incidents, such as theft of personal data, phishing attacks against senior staff, service interruptions caused by uh, custom ransomware. And organizations are going to be unable to distinguish between genuine business instructions and scams while simultaneously battling prolonged technical malware attacks. Organizations' defensive strategies and resources will be stretched pretty much beyond breaking point in most instances as they're targeted to really come under attack by multiple adversaries that are taking advantage of AI that can be bought on these crime-as-a-service platforms that I was just talking about. And, And certainly, if you talk to people like Interpol, Europol, for instance, any of the law enforcement agencies, these are the sorts of things that they're now starting to be very much more worried about. So what do organizations do to prepare to fight off such attacks? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, organizations really have to spend the time, the effort, the resource, looking at how they can improve the way they analyze behavior, certainly on the networks, as AI is adopted by malicious actors. And when I talk about networks, it isn't just your own corporate network, because of course we have the supply chain issues too. So the network that we're talking about is very much larger. And so the scope of work is very much greater than perhaps we've seen in in the past. But here again is somewhere where AI 
based defenses can help. So I do think we're going to get ourselves into a little bit of a situation where AI is facing off against AI, if you see what I mean, and how that pans out, we'll have to wait and see. I think it's going to be on an organization by organization basis, depending on the degree of sophistication that exists on both sides, actually, of attack and defense. And in the report, we do make a number of recommendations. So, you know, specifically, I think in, in the short term, it is about awareness. You know, leaders need to raise awareness of AI-based attack tools that are starting to emerge. We need to be talking about this more within organizations, within our own security clusters. I think organizations should also add AI-based attacks to their threat event catalog and improve their SOC and incident response teams to really look out for the ways in which they can shorten response times to some of these potential threats that are out there. That's the short term. I think uh, longer term, businesses need to look inevitably at increasing investment in AI-based tools that help to prevent, detect, and respond to cyber attacks. Perhaps not in isolation, perhaps not on their own. I think there's uh, a good opportunity here for increased collaboration across the industry. But inevitably, you know, everybody needs to improve things like vulnerability management, network monitoring, deep packet inspection to just identify some of these threats. And they should also use AI-based purple team tools and techniques to probe and understand weaknesses in networks and systems and conduct, you know, cybersecurity exercises to rehearse and to really enrich some of the mitigation activities. I think that one of the things that will become even more important is the response. So, you know, a lot of the recommendations I've just been talking about are about detection. I think prevention is probably something that has really fallen by the wayside. Some people may not like me saying that, but I think we have moved to an environment where it is all about detection and response. And that's really where the main focus should be, I think. So your recommendation is that organizations actually increase their use of AI-based tools. But I understand that the next trouble spot is that automated defenses can backfire. So can you talk a little bit about that? Mm, yeah, sure. I want to be clear as well, though, that we're not making any recommendation against AI-based tools. So it may sound to people as if we're not in favor of them. I think that they do have a really significant role to play and can really help with the way in which security is rolled out across an enterprise. But my point is that organizations need to be strategic about how they deploy them. You know, the rush to adopt automated defenses, I think, will lead to an over-reliance on security solutions that perhaps have been oversold or that security practitioners do not fully understand. And then when these solutions fail or make unforeseen decisions, they'll cause much more damage than the potential attacker, potentially crippling operations by rendering you know, applications or services unavailable. And malicious attackers will aim to cause the same disruptive impact by poisoning automated defenses. So organizations that adopt automated defenses to protect increasingly complex corporate networks will discover, I think, that these technologies today don't live up fully to the overall marketing hype and promise. And as the skill shortage and uh, cost pressures become even more acute, skilled human oversight is going to diminish, and that's going to force organizations to <laughs> lean more on trusting automated defenses that perhaps they don't fully understand. That will lead to the adoption of technological solutions that aren't potentially anyway implemented effectively, making it much harder for organizations to recover from incidents and meet compliance requirements. So embedding automated and uh, autonomous defenses in the organization's infrastructure will inevitably dilute internal knowledge about how these systems actually work, including how to remedy them when they fail. And I think that attackers will recognize that weakness and by purposely poisoning the data sets used by automated defenses, in certain instances, render organizations blind to some of that malicious activity, which of course is so important in terms of being able to prevent significant impact on your networks and systems. And, you know, organizations that blindly trust the promise of automated defensive technologies as a solution, as the only solution, may find that they do more harm than good actively working across broader expanses of some of the efforts that they've got to secure their business. It's the lack of that internal expertise that worries me the most in these systems. And I think that's going to compound the impact of uh, erroneous, you know, automated decisions, which do have the ability to cripple business operations. And I think perhaps more importantly, consume vast amounts of time to remediate. And that is something that most organizations simply don't have. So what can organizations do to avoid these outcomes? Maybe start with the short term, 
what do you recommend is an immediate response? What can companies start to do today? Yeah, I think organizations can start by assessing the level of autonomy that automated defense systems have to shut down connected devices and services. They need to examine the sources that automated defenses rely on to flag anomalies, and they should continuously monitor automated systems to protect data sets against poisoning attacks. And what can organizations do to respond longer term? Yeah, I think it's about determining whether you know your people have the relevant skills and the competencies to support automated defenses. It's about categorizing, developing, rehearsing response plans for varying levels of automated system failure. And I think as well, it's about starting to implement a strict testing and change management regime to prevent over-reliance on automated defenses. Those are some of the longer term areas for focus. I want to bring us to a final point around machines taking control, which is the complacency and confusion that can result with all of that layered security. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, defense in depth will prove to be um, something of a veneer as the array of security tools and policies and processes that organizations have built up over time begin to clash and inevitably contradict. What does that look like? Well, I think regular security incidents will have a tendency perhaps to baffle leaders who believe in the effectiveness of layered security. That could lead them to invest in even more technology in a misguided attempt to solve all their problems. And, you know, the information security industry is uh, renowned for addressing many of its more pressing issues by applying layer after layer of security policies, processes, and technologies. I think we talked about this in, in the last Threat Horizon report, this layering. The reality is that going forward, you know, organizations will find that these layers amount to little more than security theater, if I could put it that way. Where, where the flaws of contradicting security practices are masked by the complexities of each additional layer. And these clashes will result in a degraded rather than improved level of security. I think another element is that, you know, the continuous churn of strategies and technologies will create something of a, a false sense of security and perhaps organizational complacency, which attackers will see as an opportunity to exploit, you know, to compromise the business. That sort of instinctive response of leaders will be to continue to invest in additional layers of security, perpetuating that vicious cycle that fails to deliver on the promise of an improved security posture. If we look at all of that, though, I think that what it's really saying is that the true level of risk that businesses face will become much more difficult to recognize as security theater generates an overwhelming number of alerts that conceal underlying threats. And so the cost of maintaining the growing technology stack will continue to rise, yet organizations will feel increasingly disillusioned with the security technology perhaps that they've acquired. So what does the ISF recommend businesses do to prepare? I know you're not going to leave us hanging without some solutions here. No. (laughs) Well, I think tackling that threat in particular is going to demand changes that frankly can be hard to enact requiring ongoing vigilance to ensure that an organization doesn't fall victim, as I referred to earlier, you know, against this growth in security theater. Prioritizing key activities that address identified weaknesses will certainly help organizations to adopt a structured and systematic approach to managing the threat. For now, enterprises should certainly review fundamental controls and processes, making sure that the basics are covered. They need to do an in-depth assessment of the organization's security arrangements to understand the effectiveness of the layers that they have in place. That assessment will then allow them to identify links between cutting edge technologies and legacy systems to really surface some of these vulnerabilities. But further down the road, I think that organizations need to create a longer term strategic security architecture. They should review and decommission superfluous security layers You know, this is going to give them an opportunity to integrate business and regulatory requirements to avoid duplication and indeed conflict. They should also assess whether implemented uh, security controls keep information risk within acceptable levels and adjust those as necessary. I talk a lot about risk and the way in which risk needs to be managed across the enterprise. I do see certainly going forward through 2023 and a lot of the different threats that we're talking about and the way in which I think security will change this continuous need to come back to the management of risk. What is an acceptable risk for the organization? Because, you know, just talking about the three threats under this particular threat horizon theme, it's become very obvious, hasn't it, that the scope of work is just so vast. And we talk about there being a shortage of skill sets in the industry. So that means we have to focus. And the only way that we can focus effectively 
is through risk management, managing risks for our organization. And that requires all elements of the organization to come together. It's not just the job of security. So to summarize what you've shared, in order for savvy and strategic businesses to fight against the threat of machines seizing control, organizations will find themselves up against AI, industrializing high-impact attacks, automated defenses backfiring, layered security causing complacency and breakdown, and as we know from our many conversations, the human element in protecting information, remaining the weakest link, and therefore being ousted from many processes, which is a mistake. That human element is perhaps the greatest opportunity for businesses to effectively respond to these increasing threats. At the same time, we know that automated technology is not living up to its promise, and it's creating unseen gaps in defenses, and those gaps are posing a far greater risk to information security than the human weaknesses we've talked about. So organizations need to implement solutions to ensure that neither manual nor automated processes create unnecessary overlaps or gaps in security. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, I think you did. It's about making the best use of the resources that are available, isn't it? That includes machines, it includes AI, but it also includes people. And uh, if we can get all of those to work together, focus on the things that are most important from a risk standpoint to our organization, then life will become a little bit easier. Well, that's a nice place to leave our conversation. Thank you so much for the education. Next week, we'll be back for a deeper dive into the threat of identity being weaponized. Here's a preview of that conversation. Technologies such as AI, biometrics, behavior analytics are all starting to mature, resulting in early examples of deep fakes. And we've talked about that specifically last year as well in our Threat Horizon report. But it's the evolution of these technologies that will culminate in digital doppelgangers. And that poses a far greater threat. These credible facsimiles, if you like, will undermine trust, shatter the reputations of individuals and brands alike, and become widely used mechanisms of fraud to finance an expanding number of criminal activities. Be sure to log into ISF Live for the full report, which you can access via securityforum.org. And listeners, we invite you to tune in to our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can also find at securityforum.org. If you feel today's conversation was of value, you can follow the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts, and you can recommend us. That endorsement helps us reach new audiences and continue to bring you these timely discussions. You can always join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page by searching for Steve Durbin or Information Security Forum, or you can get in touch directly through our website, where you can always download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer, Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening. <laughs>